Okay, so hello and welcome everyone. So here I will do an example of a third degree price discrimination problem. As it says right here, there is no lie. So, uh, right, so the, in, the build up for this question here, uh, the bus is going to Canton. So Jerome Bettis had been inducted into the Pro Football Hall of Fame and on the radio stations in Pittsburgh as I'd be driving through, it would talk about a literal bus going to Canton to see the bus be inducted into the Hall of Fame. Okay, so presumably we have two different groups of demanders. We have those who like the Steelers and live in Pittsburgh and those who like the Steelers and don't, but might come to the area, Canton's two hours away, for the ceremony or just to see the, the Hall of Fame in general. Okay, so we got two different groups of demanders. That's sort of requirement for third degree price discrimination. We have to be able to identify different segments of, of the demand curve. We have to be able to uh, we have to be able to prevent resale, and we have to have uh, the market power to be able to offer different prices to the two groups. So we'll assume we have those things. We'll assume we're able to practice third degree price discrimination, though not yet, because at first I'll say, let's find the optimal price and quantity of tickets for the bus ride to Canton if the Hall of Fame is unable to distinguish between customers. Maybe they can't easily identify if they are coming from Pittsburgh or from further away. They haven't asked to see driver's licenses or zip codes or anything like that. And so then find the associated, uh, find the right well, I say find the associated producer surplus or profit. Let's first find the optimal price and quantity for those markets. Uh, oh, yeah, I, did, I said that here. Never mind. I can't read. So, okay. So then suppose they are actually able to distinguish between local fans and visitors. And we want to figure out what's going to be the optimal price and quantity they're going to sell in the Pittsburgh market. And then we're going to say, okay, suppose they're able to, dis to distinguish between local fans and visitors. What's the optimal price and quantity of tickets to everyone else, to those who are not coming from Pittsburgh, right? Presumably these uh, are going to be are going to be different segments of demand. They're going to probably have different uh, price elasticities of demand. Then find the total producer surplus in each market combined and combined. And then what pricing strategy is this an example of? Well, I mean, I said third degree price discrimination. So probably better pick up on that, right? So, all right. So here is the first part. When we are unable to distinguish between our demanders. So this would be the case where we have two segments of demand, but we're not able to distinguish between them at the point of sale. So there's no ID card to check. You can't check zip codes or, or um, driver's license or anything like that to identify if you are from the local area or if you're visiting. So you have to just treat them as one market. So in order to do this, what we're going to do is sum up the demand. So I have the quantity from Pittsburgh, the demand from Pittsburgh, plus the demand from the rest of the country is going to give us the total demand. And so when I sum these up, the demand from Pittsburgh, 2,500 uh, 2, minus 10p plus 1,500 minus 5p gives me the overall demand of 4,000 minus 15p. Then you'll see in this little bubble over here, I made inverse demand. So inverse demand would be the version of the demand curve that we usually would graph, right? So you usually have price on the vertical, quantity on the horizontal. That's going to be this thing, right? So of course, it's the same relationship, demand and inverse demand. It's just a matter of, are we going to have price in terms of quantity like I have here, or quantity in terms of price? Well, I've got price in terms of quantity. It's going to make it easier for me to solve for the optimal quantity uh, following the monopolies profit maximization rule. So we're going to produce the quantity that's going to set our marginal revenue equal to our marginal cost. Marginal revenue, if you remember the trick, right? So for linear demand, which we do have, this is a straight line demand curve. We know that marginal revenue is going to have the same intercept, the same vertical intercept, 800 over uh, 3, but it's going to have twice the slope as the demand curve. Marginal revenue has the same intercept, but twice the slope as the, uh, as the inverse demand. That comes as a consequence from calculus. So if you write down, if you write down the revenue for the firm, and then take the first order condition, take the derivative with respect to quantity, you're going to get you know, two times the quantity in, in every case. Anyway, so here's marginal revenue set the equal to marginal cost, which is 150. And then I'm going to solve for my optimal quantity. Well, it turns out I'm going to get a quantity of 875 that I'm going to sell overall when I combine the two markets at a price of 208 and 33 cents. Great. So now what I'm going to do, this is the case where I'm going to have a single price for both segments of the market. Cool. Well, that's not third degree price discrimination. So we better do that. So now we'll assume we are able to isolate the two groups of demanders. So we want to figure out how much are we going to sell in the Pittsburgh market? And then how much are we going to sell in the everyone else market? 
okay, so we get our Pittsburgh demand. It's going to be, uh, right, so we had 2,500 minus 10p. I'm going to convert this to inverse demand. Then I'm going to set marginal revenue equal to marginal cost. Marginal cost is still 150. It should be the same marginal cost to serve somebody on this bus trip, whether they're coming from uh, Pittsburgh or anywhere else. 150 is probably pretty high for this bus ride, but probably be mo mostly a fixed cost. But nevertheless, for the sake of the example, right? So here we have marginal revenue is equal to 250 minus 2 over or 2 tenths Q is equal to 150. And then solving, we find the optimal quantity is 500. Plugging this back into our demand curve, or the inverse demand, we find that the optimal price is going to be 200. Right? 250 minus 1 tenth times 500 is 200. So what this is telling us is we are going to sell 500 tickets in our Pittsburgh market at a price of $200 a piece. So actually, if you remember the truth about price discrimination with linear demands, it is that in the overall, if we when we sum the, sum the demands right here and find the overall quantity, right between the two, uh, combining the markets that was 875, we know that we're going to actually still sell the same quantity, but we're going to put some into one segment of the market and some into the other. So actually, without doing any further calculations, I know that if I'm putting 500 of those tickets into Pittsburgh's market, and if we have linear demand then I'm going to have to have, what, 375 tickets into the other market. OK, so let's go and verify. Now I'll show our non-Pittsburgh fans. Sure enough, that demand was quantities equal to 1,500 minus 5p. Solving for inverse demand, I have, I have uh, 300 minus 1 fifth q, which means marginal revenue is going to be 300 minus 2 fifths q. Set that equal to marginal cost of 150. And then we'll find the optimal quantity is indeed that 375 that I anticipated. Plugging in that 375 back to my demand curve, I find the optimal price is going to be 225. So I'm going to sell 375 tickets at $225 a piece to my non-Pittsburgh fans, right, to my visitors. And so you see what's happening here. If I treat all of all of my demanders as one market, I would sell 875 tickets at a price of $208.33 each. Or with third degree price discrimination, I'll send 500 tickets to my Pittsburgh fans. I'll give them a discount. I'll charge them $200 for the trip. And then I'm going to sell 375 tickets to my non-Pittsburgh demanders. I'm going to charge a price premium. I'll charge 225 from them. Why? Well, my Pittsburgh demanders are closer. They have any, they can go any weekend they want or any, any, any day that they want. And so their demand is going to be much more price sensitive. So I'm going to give them a discount. This is going to make them increase their propensity to buy. What about my inelastic demanders? Well, I'm going to be able to raise the price on them. I'll charge a premium from them. And yeah, by the law of demand, I'm going to sell a smaller quantity in that market. However, because we know demand is, is relatively more inelastic for them, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to overall increase uh, my revenue above like what, what would have happened. So I, so looking at the comparison to the single market, well, I'm going to sell the same number of total tickets, right? 875 either way. I'm just going to give a discount relative to this single price of 208.33 for my for my elast, relatively elastic demanders, and I'm going to charge a premium for my relatively inelastic demanders. Right, so here's my comment. Well, the difference is the Pittsburgh fans likely have more elastic demand, or at least relatively more elastic demand compared to the non-Pittsburgh fans. They can go to Canton anytime. It's two hours away. But the visitors pr presumably have much more inelastic demand. And that would be like the comparison between, you know, Colorado ski resorts, right? So we, you have a different package for those living local to Colorado, local to Breckenridge or Keystone or whatever, versus those flying into Denver, right? Okay, so we needed our producer surplus calculations. So the first case for our single price, where we sold 200, or 875 tickets at $208.33. Producer surplus, well, it's going to be price minus marginal cost times quantity. So uh, 50,750, 50,750. In my Pittsburgh segment of the market, I was selling 500 tickets at $200 a piece. My producer surplus is going to be price minus marginal cost. So 200 minus 150 is 50 times 500 is my 25,000.
And then in my non-Pittsburgh market, I'm going to have what 225 was price minus marginal cost was 150 times my quantity of 3, 375. My total producer surplus with third degree price discrimination is $53,125. That was compared to the situation without price discrimination. And sure enough, we increased our profits. And we would expect that to be the case because here we have more closely fit our true demand. And here's my note. For producer surplus, I'm just using price minus marginal cost times quantity. And so it's the area of a, area of a square in this case. Why? Because we had constant marginal cost. Right? So our supply curve, our marginal cost curve was constant cost. And also, because we have assumed that because we have assumed that there is no fixed cost here, producer surplus and profit were one and the same. So, okay, and then part E was just what type of what uh, I shouldn't scroll because this is annoying with the with the microphone. Uh, what pricing strategy is this an example of? Does it increase or reduce producer surplus? Explain the economic intuition underlying the strategy. Oh, we kind of did that already, right? So. Yeah, producer surplus rose as a result of third degree price discrimination. The basic idea is give a discount to the relatively elastic demanders, charge a premium from the relatively inelastic demanders. Same thing with uh, airline tickets. For near departures, departures that are happening really soon, charge a price premium. Why? Those demanders probably have relatively inelastic demand, relatively unprice responsive, and uh, offer a discount for those who are going to be booking flights in, in the future. Why? Because they have much more responsive, price responsive demand. Uh, anyway, so go ahead and conclude here.